Tibet. The environment of Tibet can be focused also on the water flowing out of Tibet. Uh, we also had an, an excellent uh, paper which was produced and shared uh, with the decision makers uh, in India about uh, the reappraisal of Tibet's policy. Uh, this was also extremely well received. It has some very, very cogent, very succinct and very uh, pointed references to what could be done to take this, uh, to, to have a look at uh, the policy of Tibet uh, from an Indian's perspective. And we also, uh, it was an inclusive kind of uh, research uh, had been sought, had across, uh, uh, across many, many uh, disciplines. Uh, to put this paper together. So there were scholars, there were diplomats, there were intellectuals, there were Tibetan experts uh, who all contributed towards the formation of this paper. We are in the process of making yet another one uh, of a similar nature. And many of our seminars in the past have all uh, contributed in their own way in the formation of this paper, which we'll be taking out uh, some sometime shortly. Uh, let me come back to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the subject in hand today. Uh, as I said, we have these three very, very eminent speakers, and I would be uh, making some introductory remarks and then handing it over. I'll just introduce them very, very briefly. I think all of you who have joined this webinar would be well acquainted with them. Uh, we have, uh, and, and this is the order in which I would request our panelists, uh, the distinguished panelists, to speak. Uh, I'll first have Butung Sharingla, who, as everybody knows, is the Vice President of the International Campaign of, for Tibet. Uh, based in Washington, D.C., a man who is right for the moment, right in there, actually looking at uh, and has followed the, the CPSA right through its, uh, its introduction into the, into the uh, House of Representatives, Senate, and then uh, being signed into law on the 20th of December 2020. Uh, second, uh, we will go with uh, uh, Mr. Claude Arpi. Who is, uh, as everybody knows, is a Tibetan Tibetologist, I would say, and an expert, a very prolific writer on Tibet, and extremely incisive uh, research that has been done, uh, and comes up uh, more often than not with nuggets of information dealing with uh, Tibet and and India, China and India Tibet relations. Uh, we have then Professor Shrikant Kondapali, uh, who is, of course, as everybody knows. Uh, uh, again, uh, an extremely well-informed uh, person on uh, on Tibet, on China, on strategic affairs, and I think a, a really a go-to person for a lot of strategic insights into how various facts and actions uh, in in this region impact on foreign policy, on security, and on China's future. Uh, that's the order uh, that, uh, if it's all right with my fellow panelists, uh, that we will go with. And uh, again, um, a little housekeeping before we actually launch into the into the meat of the of the program. Uh, this would be that uh, uh, you know we are not following the chat box uh, uh, op option uh, to raise questions because we found that many times there are lots of pros and we are not able to cover them or some people get left out. So I would appeal to the audience uh, once we conclude. Uh, our presentations and uh, the panel has has completed its uh, its address. Then we would uh, go for the raise hand option. Uh, please do raise your hand, and uh, I would request uh, Ribbon Banerjee uh, Dhar to actually look at it and and then unmute the person who is actually wanting to ask the question. Boris will remain on mute, and uh, he would ask the question, and uh, the, the panelist is is going to be addressed to will answer, or all of us could answer if it's addressed to more than one person. Uh, Ribbon could unmute us at that stage and we will take those answers. So uh, let me now, uh, on behalf of the FNVA um, and the trustees who are, who are here, Mr. Opie Tandon is here, Ribbon is here. Uh, I'm one of those uh, who are just passive uh, but around uh, the place. I'm, and uh, I don't know whether Temper Sharing lies here. Uh, so I welcome all of you on behalf of the trustees of the FNVA. Uh, now, uh, getting straight into the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, uh, as we all know, I'm just going to give you a very brief background, uh, and I'm sure the panelists will then take it up from there and uh, add a lot of uh, ballast and content to what I'm trying to say over here. So the TPSA, as we all know, was introduced uh, by uh, Republican Marco Rubio and Ben Cardin in the Senate, 
and uh, in Democrat Jim McGovern and Chris Smith in the House of Representatives. It was passed by the House of, the Represent of Representatives in uh, January 28, 2020, and by Senate in mid-December 2020, and uh, it turned into law on December 28, 2020. Uh, in, in a related development, uh, when this uh, was signed into law, uh, Scott Perry, Congressman Scott Perry, in his letter to U.S. President uh, Trump, demanded Tibet to be recognized as a separate and independent country. Uh, prior to this, Mike Pompeo appointed as Secretary Robert A. Destro of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor to serve as a special coordinator for Tibet, an office which was lying vacant since January 2017. In that capacity, Destro is responsible for promoting substantial dialogue between PRC and the Dalai Lama, coordinating U.S. projects and policy with Tibet, and for sustaining efforts to protect Tibet's cultural and religious identity and safeguard human rights in the region. Uh, as uh, most experts here would know that the TPSA is really an amended version of the Tibet Policy Act of 2002, which came into existence during the Bush administration. But in an indication just how important he considered relations with China, President George Bush distanced himself from the congressional action and wrote strong words against it in a signing statement in which he asserted the administration's right not to implement parts of the act. He wrote, and I quote, regrettably, the act contains a number of provisions that impermissibly interfere with the constitutional functions of the presidency in foreign affairs, including provisions that purport to establish foreign policy that are of significant concern, unquote. He also said that his approval to the act did not constitute his adoption of the various statements of policy in the act as U.S. foreign policy, and said that these would be taken as advisory statements only, giving them due weight that committee between the legislative and executive branches should require to the extent consistent with the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, President Trump, as we know, has broken uh, from that uh, a caveat uh, in the past. And over the last uh, year or so, we have seen some very, very important uh, legislation which has come into being uh, when he was dealing with China. I'm not going to the Hong Kong and I'm not going to Taiwan, but I'll stay with, with Tibet. Uh, President Trump predictably did not take a Bush-like view on the Tibetan Policy and, and Support Act, which introduces strong provisions on Tibet, but he added teeth in the form of threat of sanctions, including travel bans on Chinese officials. Now, I think the important thing is how does the Biden administration expect it to, is expected to frame its own China policy and how it views the TPSA? Still, most US administration like the Trump administration included have broadly maintained a diplomatic balance between relation with China and support for Tibet and the Dalai Lama. Uh, the State Department has so far had a separate section in its annual reports on human rights and religious freedom, but there has been no, really no real push for talks with Dalai Lama or in the release of political prisoners. Now, these are the amendments which have been taken up in the Tibet uh, Support and Policy Act in 2020, and it actually uh, makes US policy to oppose attempts by Beijing to install its own Dalai Lama, and uh, in, I quote, in a manner inconsistent with Tibetan Buddhism, in which the succession or identification of Tibetan Buddhist lamas, including the Dalai Lama, should occur without interference. Inverted commas close. It also makes reference to the Chinese government measures on the management of the reincarnation of living Buddhas in 2007 and a March 2019 statement by the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman that this reincarnation of living Buddha, including the Dalai Lama, must comply with Chinese laws and regulations and follow religious rituals and historic convention. It also refers uh, to the uh, uh, 11th uh, Panchal Lama and, the, uh, and it says that the authority to recognize the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama lies with the Chinese government and its officials. Uh, it also uh, looks at, uh, you know, taking, taking a cue from the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, it talks about making sanctions against uh, 
Chinese officials who grossly violate internationally recognized human rights. Uh, this is also an important uh, factor in this. Uh, interestingly, there are other provisions in the TPSA, which includes protecting the environment of the Tibetan Plateau, calling for greater international cooperation on, on sharing of waters and uh, amongst all riparian nations that would promote and it could also have a, have a great implication on the water resources coming out of Tibet and, and feeding the lower riparians. Um, as predicted, uh, uh, the Sichung um, uh, made a statement saying that this was a landmark and a momentous landmark for the Tibetan people. Um, the Chinese have responded in a, in a typically, typically, uh, uh, in a typical and predictable fashion by condemning the act and saying that is a gross interference in the affairs of, of uh, China. And it has actually uh, bundled it along with Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and given a, a broad brush uh, uh, attack and uh, against this uh, particular uh, act. Uh, I think the uh, for us here uh, we are uh, the topic, uh, as you would all remember, is uh, is really the the Tibet uh, Tibetan Policy and Support Act. And uh, the focus that we would like to do is uh, not only discuss a little bit about the act from everybody's uh, individual perspective, the panelists, but also examine whether this particular act, how does it impact and how, what are the implications for India? Is it a challenge or is it an opportunity for New Delhi uh, to take the Tibetan issue, if I may call it, uh, some but people call it Tibetan card or whatever, in whatever nomenclature you would like to call it, but how to take this forward, what do we see it as? So with these uh, few introductory remarks, uh, let me hand over the floor to uh, Bujin Sheringla for his presentation. Uh, Bujin, uh, uh, take your time. Uh, we have 15, 20 minutes uh, where you can make your presentations, after which I could make a very, very small, if I'll try and make a small summary, if I can, a couple of important points, and then take it on uh, to Claude and then on to uh, Shrika. Thank you and over to you. Um, Thank you so much, Mr. Varma, and uh, good evening to you all in India. Good morning over here. Uh, I, Mr. Varma has made my task easier because you've given an overview of the TPSA. So what I'll do is I'll give you a background to the uh, Tibetan Policy and Support Act, then uh, lead on to what does the TPSA do, do, and then the implications of the TPSA for the United States and China, and uh, finally concluding with what are the implications for India. So, Raybun, if you may have the uh, slides, please. Yeah. Next one, please. Yeah. So, oh, when we talk about the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, we should not look at it in isolation because this is something to do with the American political system. And in an American political system, no legislations like that comes out in overnight. So there has to be some sort of foundational uh, structure to it. Uh, from the TPSA perspective, the foundational structures are the uh, three previous legislations on Tibet. For one, uh, Ms. Warma has mentioned, it's the Tibetan Policy Act of 2002, which uh, was the first time where the United States uh, brought together all its initiatives on Tibet and uh, made it uh, compact as one unit. Uh, that laid out the political position of encouraging dialogue for the Tibetan uh, people uh, in terms of uh, dialogue between the Chinese government and the representatives of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The other legislation is the Congressional Gold Medal to His Holiness the Dalai Lama of 2007. Uh, if you look at that uh, Gold Medal Act, because that Gold Medal has to be awarded after the passing of an uh, legislation in the Congress and which has a high standard of uh, passage. Two thirds members of Congress have to be there to just to introduce the uh, act. So uh, that act talk, talks about the uh, relevance of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to the United States and what it means, what he means to the American people. And that therefore it draws a connection between him and the American people, which is subsequently reflected in the TPSA. Thirdly, of course, is the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act of 2018. There again, uh, 
this uh, reciprocal access to Tibet Act took, takes up the Tibetan issue from a different perspective, rather than looking at the Tibetan issue as a foreign um, matter. It talks about the right of American citizens, including Tibetan Americans, to having access to Tibet, and therefore uh, showing that Tibet is isolated, Tibet is closed, and calling for the opening up of Tibet because of the uh, re of its relevance to American citizens and Tibetan Americans. And that is why from those three broad themes, we have reached onto this Tibet uh, TPS. Next, please. Now, uh, if, uh, if you look at all these three legislation, uh, uh, the sum total of them can be brought into these two categories. First is that now, uh, they institutionalized American support to Tibet. Until then, American support to Tibet was whether in the form of initiatives by members of Congress or certain executive officials. Uh, and it did not have some sort of a legal uh, foundation to it. But the Tibetan Policy Act gave legal foundation to all the initiatives that the United States was taking, whether it was programmatic or policy. Secondly, uh, particularly through RATA, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, uh, the United States made it clear that the Tibetan issue is uh, as much a domestic issue of the United States as it is uh, a foreign issue. This is important because, as Mr. Warmer mentioned earlier, China continues to make the case that uh, anything relating to Tibet is internal affairs of China. So this is the American response uh, and uh, telling China that America, United States has as much right to talk about the Tibet issue from a certain perspective because it concerns American interest. Next, please. Now, uh, within the uh, TPSA, these are the uh, main issues that uh, I think Mr. Warma touched on uh, uh, almost all of these. Uh, at the political level, it supports dialogue, uh, but from uh, an addition from the TPA is the fact that this dialogue is without any conditions and also makes it uh, uh, imperative for the United States administration to reach out to other governments in terms of the international coalition building. It also uh, connects the opening of a consulate in Lhasa, which is there in TPA, to the fact that unless the Chinese government allows that uh, American consulate to be opened, uh, no American, uh, no Chinese consulate will be allowed to be opened in the United States. Uh, this is now uh, part of the law. Thirdly, from a religious freedom perspective, the United States takes a position. And here I have to be very clear that America doesn't say who is the recognition, recognized reincarnation or not. America doesn't, uh, as I use the uh, phrase, pontificate on Tibetan religious issue. Rather, it supports the right, the authority of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhists towards the issue of uh, Tibetan reincarnation. That is something that uh, also, also very significant. Next, please. And then oh, within the previous context is a uh, reference to the Central Tibetan Administration, which again wasn't there in the TPA. Uh, and that is also, uh, as has been noted by uh, the political leadership in Dharamsala, it's something that uh, is uh, important uh, from that perspective. Uh, next uh, important aspect of the TPA is that it links the Tibetan issue to the geostrategic importance uh, uh, of the water and uh, connection of Tibetan water to that geostrategic uh, policy formulation, uh, which is again uh, important because in, in the South and South, particularly in the Southeast Asian countries, rivers coming from Tibet impact their lives, but these countries do not have or have had that thinking about what uh, uh, Tibet has meant to them. And this connects the dots between these two. Uh, finally, the uh, United States has been uh, rendering humanitarian assistance to the Tibetan people, both in Tibet and in exile for the last several years. And now these have been formalized here in, in the Tibetan Policy and Support Act. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Now, if you look at what the Tibetan Policy and Support Act could mean for India, I should go back and first say that all these legislations have been possible because of two main factors. First of all, uh, 
prior to 1979, the Tibetan or, or the issue in the United States had some sort of emotional connection, but uh, that wasn't that uh, 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 strongly translated into poly policy makers uh, formulation. In 1979, His Holiness the Dalai Lama visited the United States for the first time, and since then he visited visited this country for many years. That built up a, a basis of support in the policy making community and uh, in the uh, government. And these had been uh, we, the friends of Tibet, the supporters of Tibet, have been able to capture that support and to translate that into American policy. Uh, and that is one thing. Secondly, I think at that time, Mr. Lodi Gary, who was the special envoy of His Honesty the Dalai Lama here in Washington, he, he was able to really see the uh, space for uh, the Tibetan issue being taken up at, uh, from an American political system perspective. And therefore, we had, have had a series of initiatives here in Washington, D.C. that was supported by the uh, increasing Tibetan American population that created a constituency for American policymakers to look at. And that, again, uh, made it imperative for the American political uh, leaders, particularly the legislators, to look at the Tibetan issue, not just as a foreign affairs issue, but as a matter of their constituents' interest. And these have made it uh, uh, effective for the, such legislations to be passed here in the United States. Now, in terms of India, I'm, I'm very clear. I don't think the TPSA as such has a message for India because more than the United States, India knows about the Tibetan issue. India cares about the Tibetan issue. And uh, India has a historical connection with uh, Tibet that the United States doesn't have. But what India lacked in terms of... Uh, uh, American uh, involvement is the fact that uh, the Tibetan issue, from my perspective, was not looked upon from a policy at a political angle in the public arena as it ought to have been looked at. Rather, the Tibetan people have seen as historical friends of India, uh, were people who needed humanitarian uh, assistance uh, in the early uh, stage of life in exile, and therefore these were given, and that. Uh, uh, people did not really uh, comprehend the strategic importance of Tibet to India. Now I'm glad that there is more uh, analytical perspective of the Tibetan issue in India, which is uh, needed uh, because India has a rightful uh, place in the future of Tibet. So uh, two areas that might have uh, some sort of relevance is the issue of Tibetan religious freedom, particularly Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism, when we say Tibetan Buddhism, it, it's not just talking about Tibetan as a people, but more as a, a religious tradition that goes beyond the borders of Tibet and uh, to the uh, Indian Himalayas for past several centuries in a way. And therefore, uh, just as the United States is making a case about uh, Tibetan religious freedom based on uh, including American Buddhists interest in it. The TPSA talks about how Tibetan Buddhism is also practiced in the United States. India can also look at the issue from the rights of the Indian Buddhists who follow Tibetan Buddhism and to whom the issue of the Dalai Lama or the reincarnation system is as much of a significance as it is to uh, the Tibetans in Tibet. Uh, secondly, uh, the waters of Tibet can be looked at by India from a strategic perspective because uh, India has been talking about Tibetan waters, Brahmaputra, and its impact on India, not just on India, Southeast Asian countries. And that can be looked at again from a, a quote unquote, a non political perspective to say. And these may be useful for the Indian policymakers to think over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bujungla. In fact, uh, I think you've made some uh, very important points about uh, the run-up to the the adoption of the of the T uh, TPSA. And I think uh, I did forget in my opening remarks to mention. I think the two of the most important things was that uh, you know the Americans have actually looked at it uh, as less as an internal affair of China, but more as a, a problem of, uh, of humanitarian uh, proportions. And, and to an extent, I think from an Indian point of view, civilization uh, uh, proportions too. Uh, I think the point that you made about uh, the consulates is a very important one. 
I see. Now, the question uh, that I may have, and I, I don't know whether I should raise it now, perhaps uh, you could answer it later in a Q&A, but something that I would like to say is that, you know, what was the, it would be nice to share something about uh, how did this go through the passage uh, of this act, uh, right from, you know, 2019 and uh, to exactly what it was, what was the kind of dynamics that was involved, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, there are efforts in, 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 in adopting a legislation and bringing it to the to the passing it through the House of Representatives as well as the Senate, so something of that nature, if you could uh, give us uh, later uh, in this. But I think the important points are that the U.S. has actually come out in the open to say that it had to and uh, has given, uh, has, has pointed out that it is not the right of the Chinese to either select, educate or venerate, for that matter, uh, the reincarnation of the Lamas, and especially His Holiness Lai Lama. And I think that's a very important point. Uh, let me come back to uh, you later uh, you know, with a few more questions that I'm, I will have. But uh, So let me move on to, uh, to Claude. And uh, Claude, the floor is yours. Uh, could you please give us also from your perspective a whole background about how you see this and in the context of uh, Tibet and India and then in a slightly larger context of China and India, and how do you see whether this does present an opportunity for India or is it just a challenge which will be left uh, as it is. Thank you, and over to you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, my friends from uh, FNVA. And they are very kind with me. They put a photo of me it's, uh, when I was 30 years old, so I'm very grateful for that. So I, I trust Revan for doing something like that. So thank you. Uh, is it a challenge opportunity? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not sure, but you have to realize that India is not America. Unfortunately, very unfortunately, India, we have 4,056 kilometers of border with China, which is, includes Gilgit-Baltistan, or 3,450 if you uh, don't include Gilgit-Baltistan. And this border is very hot. You have seen the last few months what has happened. Today, again, there was a news that uh, China has built a village two kilometers south of the Mark Mahon line in Upper Subansari on the Sari Chu, on the Sari River. So that's very serious. Today, there's 50,000 Indians facing 50,000 Chinese on the ridges in Ladakh. And sometimes the temperature goes to minus 30 or 40. So India cannot react or even act the same way than the U.S. Everybody can understand that. And uh, that's a very uh, difficult situation. I think if you ask me, I should not say, but Mr. Xi Jinping is a criminal because to send 50,000 of his own soldiers to Ladakh, these youngsters, they are not used to the climate. They're getting sick, they're lacking oxygen. Same thing for the Indian. So uh, I think today we are facing a very difficult neighbor very difficult neighbor. And that has to be taken into consideration when you speak about challenge or opportunity. Now, another small detail, but uh, today in India, I don't see a bipartisan uh, legislation or anything of that sort in the Lok Sabha or in the Raja Sabha. As you are aware, as time the government say white, the opposition say black, or if the opposition say white, the government will say black. It's very unfortunately, and unfortunate, but it, it, it is a fact. Um, before I start going through the points, I would like to pay an homage to the Tibetan soldiers who fought. And actually in the um, Ladakh confrontation, there was one day where the turning point, it was on the 29th of of uh, July of 19, 2020, when the ridges on the Kailash Range were taken uh, mostly by the Tibetan soldiers. So in one way, they have paid whatever India has given to the Tibetan since 1959 and 1962. They have repaid, I, I should not call it a debt, but what they have done is quite remarkable. One of the officers, uh, Tansing Nima, lost his life so I want, I want to remember what they have done for India because it was a turning point in the eight rounds of negotiation 
everything changed after that that day when uh, India could have a bargaining ship to uh, discuss negotiate with uh, with China. So um, you spoke, uh, Bhutan spoke about uh, stakeholder. In India is a stakeholder because of the border, because of this uh, 4,056 kilometer of border, but also because of the affinity between the people of India. You mentioned about Buddhism, but also there was extensive trade. I spent the last four years of my life just working uh, to publish these four books on the India-Tibet relation between 47 and 62. And the uh, uh, relations were so extensive. Traders, in Yatong there was 50 uh, uh, Indian shops, for example. In Gyanse also. Uh, the people could go to Kailash Mansarovar without a visa, without a paper, till 1954, when the India signed the Panchil Agreement, who was the beginning of uh, the downgrading of the uh, relation between in, uh, India and Tibet. And in 62, it was finished. So um, I just mentioned another thing that in 1959, in, in May, uh, the Prime Minister of India, Nehru, went to Masori and met His Holiness. And he said it was a very hot meeting, I think a very unpleasant meeting. Uh, His Holiness never mentioned it, but I, uh, from the minutes from the Prime Minister's office, you can say that it was uh, unpleasant. It was so unpleasant that Nehru uh, sent uh, the father of Mr. Chef Shankar Menon the former consul general in Lhasa to apologize to the, to the Dalai Lama that he had been very rude. But in any case, it was decided that day that the, um, India would help for education, for rehabilitation, and would do nothing politically. So we are today still having that heritage of doing nothing politically. And if you look, uh, India, except during the time of Lal Bado Shastri in 1965, when India voted in favor of uh, the resolution in the UN, India has not uh, helped Tibet politically at all. So we have to undo that uh, policy of Nehru, and it's not easy. Now I will go through the different um, issues mentioned by Bhushanla and see how India could, uh, what India could do about it. That's all, of course, my views. And uh, I don't pretend to have the to be, to be the right view, but I, I want to just share them with you. Now, regarding the um, 2007 management measure for the reincarnation of living Buddhas, uh, that uh, TPSA answered and uh, very clearly that the de decision uh, regarding the selection, education, and veneration of Tibetan Buddhist religious leaders are exclusively a spiritual matter that should be made by the appropriate uh, religious authority. I don't think India today needs uh, legislation, but if simply the external affairs minister or the Joint Secretary XP, the, uh, who is a spokesperson of the MEA, would say that the Dalai Lama has always been a uh, honored guest. Since he crossed the border in Chutangmu on 31st March of 1959, he has been an honored guest. India has been looking after its needs. It, India will continue and India will do so for the 15 Dalai Lama. And it's up to the present Dalai Lama to decide if he wants to go for emanation, for reincarnation. But whatever the uh, Dalai Lama decides, India would support. India is a secular state. It's mentioned in the constitution. India has no business like the United States to enter in the uh, religious matter, but India can just uh, say very clearly, openly, just a word of the uh, spokesperson or a word of the uh, external affairs minister or the foreign secretary, India will support whatever the dilemma will, will decide. It's up to him to decide and we will support. And the 15 dilemma, if he wants to come back in India, he, is, he will be an honored guest and we will give him the same facility that we are providing uh, today to the 14th Dalai Lama. About the consulate, um, I find it very interesting that the 
uh, about the US uh, legislation because I wish that it would put some uh, pressure on India. But it's not that India has not tried. In the 2006, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon was in the ministry at that time, even before when he was in, uh, as ambassador in um, Beijing, he tried. When he was foreign secretary, he tried and uh, to ask the Chinese to reopen. Emotionally, he was connected by the fact that he, his father had been consul general between 1954 and 1956. So he, he tried to push it, but China never accepted. They said, we will give you Chengdu. Actually, India said that if you, uh, we will not open the consulate general in Madras, in Chennai, if you don't open in, in Lhasa. And after that, India dropped that. They say, okay, we'll open it in Chengdu, but this even didn't take place. So there is a background. India has tried, but as you know, China is a difficult customer. Now, um, that issue of the consulate, there's a background to it. And um, I must say that in my book, there's about 100 chapters in the four volumes, and I have not spent I spent more time, 10 times more time on that particular chapter on closure of the uh, Consulate General, Indian Consulate General in Lhasa than any other chapter. I was really bothered. I tried to find out the MEA never opened their, their file, but um, the consulate was closed. That was the most stupid thing that India did. It closed the consulate on December 15 of 62. It means uh, one month after uh, the ceasefire or four weeks after, after the ceasefire. It closed for no reason. It didn't need to close it down. Since uh, the, uh, Sir Basil Gold, since the 1930s, India had a uh, presence. Uh, it took the form of uh, a full-fledged mission till 1952, and it was downgraded uh, discreetly without telling the parliament or without telling anybody in 1952 under the uh, KM Panikar's uh, advice to, to Nehru. That was a, a huge blender. But the closure of that uh, uh, consulate general in Lhasa was uh, irreparable loss for India because India had interest, not only sentimental inter interest in Tibet, but also at commercial interest, all the border closed down, the, uh, the three uh, in Indian uh, trade uh, agency closed down, the, all the pilgrims going freely to Kailash Mansarova was stopped, and that was a real tragedy after the 1962 war. Um, so I think that uh, India should really put pressure on China. Also, obviously today with the happening in, in Ladakh and today there's a new uh, front which has opened in um, Arunachal Pradesh. China has built a small uh, village uh, inside India's territory, two kilometers south of the Mac Mountain line. So I don't think that uh, China is in the mood to accept, but India should openly and frankly, and put a lot of pressure on China to uh, one day reopen that uh, consulate in, in Lhasa. Um, in uh, the mig migration, the, the act, the American acts uh, specifically ask uh, uh, Beijing to stop uh, migration and settlement of the uh, non-Tibetan inside Tibet. Today, that is a major issue. Um, they have done what they call the Xiaohong villages. The, they have done more than 600 of these villages. Now, about 100 of these villages are on the Indian border. You, from uh, Arunachal to North Sikkim, to uh, north of uh, Imachal, to uh, Ladakh, east of... Uh, East of Ladakh, you have these uh, new villages without mushrooms in, in no time. And the uh, last one is in, uh, in India, uh, south of the, the, the line. So uh, that, that uh, India should do something to stop. 
uh, China said that they have lifted a lot of people out of out of poverty, but uh, I don't know if this village they are lifting up the Tibetan out of poverty. The, most of this village, whether it is in Tona, in Lunse, in Subansari, uh, uh, north of Subansari, in Kampatong, uh, north of Sikkim, or even in Chumbi Valley or in uh, Nari, everywhere uh, these villages are so big and are not. Comments, and they are not proportional with the size of the population. It means that they are going to bring Han people and they are going to bring other people on India's border. And of course, they will take people which they consider safe. So it's a very, very serious issue for India. India has not put enough uh, energy or research into it. The government has only now started reacting they will start reacting tomorrow because of the the villages which has been built uh, uh, south of the Macmahon line. But uh, that is very late, very late in the day. And Andred villages just on the border is something very, very serious. About the rivers and the water, uh, China is undertaking huge uh, projects in Tibet. One is, of course, the the um, the train, the railway line between uh, Sichuan and uh, Ningxi and Lhasa, but also uh, a very big um, hydropower uh, station in Metok area. And um, this, uh, it's not a dam, it's a hydropower station. It's a series of uh, run of the river, nine dams, but it will be three times the size of the Three Gorges Dam. So it has very, very large implication. So for the time being, India has not re reacted officially to it, but it's high time because they, uh, all the population south of this uh, area uh, will be affected. Will be affected, maybe China will say, we will not divert the water, we will just produce electricity and uh, run up the river dam will uh, get the same amount of water downstream that there is upstream. But uh, there is a danger that is the most seismic uh, area. You, we know about the Rima 1950. It was the second largest uh, earthquake in, uh, in the 20th century. And uh, this could happen. So to have this series of nine dams on the on the Yalong Tampo on the, which becomes the, the the Brahmaputra is extremely serious for India and um, I think the MEA should drop its shyness and should really uh, put up very strongly in stronger terms and not accept just what uh, Peking said. Um, Dai Lama, uh, the, uh, Peking uh, dialogue uh, with no precondition. Uh, it, the, uh, India should really, uh, really help uh, Tibet and uh, Dharamsala to, uh, I don't think they will recognize the gov government in exile, but it should really do uh, push for having a negotiation. Though the negotiations today are very difficult. As you see, there is a round of talks already between the core commander of the 14th Corps and his counterpart in China, and nothing has come out of it. So uh, Dharamsala doesn't have all the push or the power that India can, can have. So that, that's really a, a big issue. And, uh, but India should really help, try to help, and understand the, the concern of Dharamsala. And let's see what's happened also with the next Sikyong, if, if he's able to really push through, through by having a very closer contact with uh, Delhi. That's very important to that because the the fate of the Tibetan is very much linked to what happened to the uh, to this happening in Delhi. The 
I, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the U.S. government willingness to strengthen and financially support the functioning of the CTA. Already, uh, Delhi is doing it in a small way, but it should do it more in an open way. They are not uh, announcing publicly what the, the amount they are giving, but it, it should be done. It should help the CTA, not only the education, uh, through the Department of Education, not only Nancy, the home uh, ministry, but also uh, other uh, activities of, of, of the uh, Tibetans. I'm think, thinking, for example, you have Menzikang. Now, uh, since a few years, Menzikang, the Tibetan um, Medical Center has been part of the, um, has been recognized uh, under uh, Ayush. Ayush is under the Ministry of Health is Ayurveda, Yoga, uh, Sida, Unani, and one more. So uh, the Tibetan system of medicine has been uh, recognized. And uh, of course, it's, it supports the Ladakhi Amshi, but also the, the Tibetan. But it should do, do it in a much la larger way. So that way, there is different possibility of helping uh, the, the Tibetans. And, uh, they cannot do it maybe fully directly or they don't want to do it. They don't want to jump because of this border issue. Unless that border issue is solved and it may take some time, uh, it will certainly not be solved be before uh, June, July, and uh, now they are going to celebrate 100 years of the party. So for, it's difficult to solve immediately for China. I think Mr. Xi Jinping has been fooled by some of his generals. I'm uh, thinking of uh, General uh, Zhao Zhongxi, who is a uh, Western, um, Western Theater Command commander, who knows very well Tibet, who has been posted 20 years in Tibet, who has walked every inch of the, at least not the Ladakh, uh, um, not the Ladakh sector, which is, comes under the Xinjiang military region, but the, under the Tibet military region, he knows the uh, entire area. So I think he has full Xi Jinping, but Xi Jinping has certainly agreed to uh, do something in Ladakh. And actually, if you look at the Ladakh, where they, uh, the Chinese first tried to grab Indian land, that, that is um, in Gogra, uh, Earth Spring. Uh, that is Galwan, and that is the finger on Pangong. This uh, area were not disputed. If you look at any Chinese map, published till very recently, they are not claiming. You see the, in uh, Galwan sector, the uh, border was clearly six, seven kilometers. So what Zhao Zhongxi tried is to advance for a few kilometers for having a better strategic position. But on their own map, they have advanced on what they were showing on, on their own maps. So he thought that in, he took India for granted, in India would not react. Unfortunately for Zhao Zhongxi and for Xi Jinping now, uh, they, India uh, sent 50,000 of its Javan and officers to Ladakh. So now uh, Xi Jinping doesn't know what to do, but they cannot, if Today, he accepts to come back to the situation before April, he will lose his job because uh, the, there will be a lot of people in, in China. Of course, they're controlling the, the media and everything, but there's limit also through the Weibo and all the blogs. Uh, infiltration, the information is filtrating. I think uh, India should support also like uh, all India radio uh, program, Tibetan program in much larger way, like the American are doing through uh, VOA and uh, Radio Free Asia, should do it very and try to inform. I think it's very important for India to connect with the population in, in, in Tibet, the Tibetan population in Tibet. And even for Dalamsala, I think Dalamsala also should do uh, more efforts to connect with, with Tibet. You imagine today, there's uh, three uh, land ports, which is uh, Chiptila, uh, Lipuklekla, and Natula. But the uh, Tibetan traders, they can't really have, con when they come to India, 
for a few months in a year. They can't have contact with, uh, very, very few contact with their uh, uh, Indian counterpart. Today, the population in, in Ladakh has hardly any contact with the population on the other side of the LAC. So this, um, India should find ways to really open up this contact. And I think Dharamsala has a great role to play in that. Um, I think also Tibetan studies, there's very little Tibetan studies in Indian universities. Now, I think the, that Shivnagar University has started a program of Himalayan and Tibetan studies, but very few. Of course, you have the um, Institute of Buddhist Studies in Sarnath, you have one in Leh, you have uh, one in Bomdela, and but there's, uh, there's a need for more political, historical, and uh, trade, everything. If you take, for example, the um, Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla, they are do, uh, doing uh, hardly anything for the uh, studying the old relation between Tibet. So this should change. Hopefully in the next few years, it will change. I think it will be in, in, uh, very important. Uh, that the TPSA demand that the, uh, China ask ask them to address the aspiration of the Tibetan people with re regard to their distinct historical, cultural, and religious and linguistic identity. I India has done it in, in a way, uh, that's why the monastery in South India are flourishing. Uh, but once again, it's only for education and the monastic. But much, much more could be uh, done. I think ultimately, um, India would have to have a department of Himalayan and Tibetan affairs. The, the Himalayan states have been neglected because if in the Indian democracy, if you have only few MPs, you can't go very far. Ladakh has one MP, Uttarakhand has four MPs, Sikkim has uh, one MP, I'm speaking of Lok Sabha, uh, Arunachal has two MPs, so they are not heavy weights in uh, Indian political. So there was the idea of having uh, uh, that they work together because many of the issues they are sharing this, uh, the, and especially their, their relation with Tibet. So the, some effort should be um, made in that sense. And um, like the Tibetan language, the, the Bokya language should be recognized in the Indian constitution. It has been pending for years and years and years and nothing has happened. And fortunately, government has apparently more uh, urgent uh, things to do and to, uh, problem to deal with and uh, nothing. But the pressure which is happening today in Ladakh should be an eye opener. You, if you see that China has made a favor to India and to the world because I don't know uh, what Bushan feel about it, but that uh, legislation in the U.S. would have not passed if China had not put everyone, uh, started this uh, virus and spreading their virus all, all, all over the world. So the same way India slowly is opening, getting aware. Unfortunately, the MEA is not fully aware yet of uh, what is happening. And many people still believe that we can deal with China, but we can deal with China by doing strong. Now, what has happened in uh, that uh, small village, which is um, two kilometers south of the Makmaon Lang in, um, uh, in, Aruna, in Arunachal Pradesh, in uh, south of Migeton in, in, in Tibet. Now the government, they have also satellites, they see what's happening, they know what's happening, why nothing has been said, nothing has been done. You don't put a village in, in, uh, uh, in, in one day. In the image, satellite imagery of um, September 2019 shows nothing, shows a bridge on the Sari Chu, on the Sari River. In uh, November of 2020, there's a full village, 110 houses. Who is going to stay in this house? 
their policy for the Xiaokang village is usually you give a better life to the pe people living there. But nobody has ever lived there. So who are they going to bring? Are they going to bring Han settlers? Are, are they going to bring um, people from the Chantang that they don't want them, the nomads, to stay in the sea? It's a huge problem for India. Maybe because China is doing more and more foolish things on the front, maybe it will wake up. It's what I hope. And um, I don't think to conclude that we can think in the term of a legislation in, in, in India. But I think uh, to have a more friendly Tibetan policy and eventually one day to have a Department of Himalayan and Tibetan Affairs would greatly help to really push not only the scholarship, but uh, try to revive the trade, uh, try to uh, keep the religious institution uh, alive and blooming. And because China is trying and uh, the Dalai Lama also, they should very clearly say that whatever His Holiness will decide, we will go and we will support him because he has always been a honored guest of India and he will remain and the 15 uh, Dalai Lama will also be a honored guest of India. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Claude. I think uh, very insightful. Uh, I think uh, basically you've highlighted some very important points. One, of course, is the challenge that is because of the territorial uh, uh, contiguity between China and India, it becomes more difficult for us to to react in the same way as, as the U.S. Uh, could and would and is doing. Uh, and also, I take in the point that, uh, and I think Buchung Kuala could possibly dilate on this uh, later, is uh, is this something that happened only because of the pandemic and the, and the U.S. angst against China for what it had done in terms of the Wuhan virus that we went into a fast track? Or was this in the making and what are these? And that was what I was alluding to earlier when I said that I'd like to know exactly what happened in Washington, D.C. during that period. Was it only a result of this, of the anger? Or was it something in the, in the works that was happening? The other point I think I, I, I take very, uh, uh, I think it's a very important point that you made, uh, Claude, was regarding uh, the interest on Tibet and Tibetan studies in India, uh, as well as the uh, communication uh, of uh, affairs in Tibet and on the Tibetan people, uh, which could also be taken up by the All India Radio and other uh, communication channels, uh, which could be government or even could be private uh, for that matter. Uh, you also did mention that uh, legislation might be difficult, and I agree with that. Legislation might be very difficult for us to do it, but we could always find convergence and uh, coordinate with other, uh, not only the US, but if there are other democracies uh, which feel the same way, and I think uh, the ICT others are quite active in trying to create uh, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, support in various other uh, geographies in the world to see how they could all converge on the Tibet issue eventually. And India could also then find a role for itself. But I think India's role really is a lot with the CTA, with, with Dharamsala, with the Solina, the Lai Lama, because they are here, they're present. And a lot of things that we might do have to be taken very carefully and has to be done in a very calibrated manner. But I do take your points uh, back and I think they're very important ones and I'm sure uh, we would be visiting these later in the uh, Q&A and when we open it up to the audience. So now, now let me turn to uh, to Professor Shikan Kondapali, who as I said is, a, is a, a great strategist and a great thinker in these areas. Um, Shikant, if I could uh, request you to give us an overview about how the TPSA impacts on the Tibetan diaspora as well as the Indian, establishing Indian policy, and uh, what do you see as, as challenges and opportunities for India, if there are any? Over to you, uh, Mr. Shikant. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Varma. It's a pleasure to be back at the FNV. Uh, uh, let me thank uh, Mr. Opie Tandon as well as Ribon for giving me this opportunity. Wonderful to listen to the previous speakers as well. Uh, uh, what I would uh, suggest is uh, let me briefly touch upon the uh, U.S. policies towards Tibet first uh, and then move on to what Mr. Obama had uh, mentioned about challenge or uh, as an opportunity for India. Um, 
the American policy uh, towards Tibet uh, has gone through a zigzag policy. Uh, there has been uh, considerations about uh, geopolitical interests. Uh, there were considerations about uh, the sovereignty, suzerainty aspects. Uh, there were considerations of Wilsonian self-determination. Uh, that is reflected in the 1960 Secretary of State Christian Hattert's letter to the uh, to the Dalai Lama on uh, the self-determination principle, uh, and is reflected in the United Nations resolutions. So General Assembly uh, had endorsed many of these, uh, 1961, 1965, uh, and so on. Uh, then there is also the pragmatic response, the business interests. Uh, Tibet did had uh, a lot of uh, American in, uh, investments uh, across China as the uh, the Trump administration is winding up. Uh, there is the mention by Foreign Minister Wang Yi about 77,000 American companies working in China for $700 billion um, investments uh, from the U.S. Uh, and they're all making profits despite the COVID-19. Uh, so that pragmatic uh, kind of uh, approach is also visible in the American response towards Tibet. Uh, and of course, there is the, uh, we do not know whether TPSA will be implemented. Like uh, the Bush administration before on the, uh, the uh, act that was signed in 2002, um, uh, Biden could possibly overlook uh, many of these or delay in implementing the many of the provisions of the TPSA. We do not know yet uh, how this is going to pan out in the near future. Uh, nevertheless, these uh, four main approaches uh, that United States has uh, on uh, geopolitical uh, pragmatic response, uh, ideological, that is, self-determination, uh, and, uh, of course, the other considerations. Uh, these uh, kept on uh, going from one to the other, uh, and there is uh, the uh, never in American history they have looked at the sovereignty factor. Uh, although, of course, uh, as the previous speakers have mentioned, the, the gold medal, the congressional medal, uh, these would suggest to the profile of the Tibetan side increasing. Uh, nevertheless, they have not touched upon their sovereignty. In fact, in 1943, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, uh, which sent two officers to meet the Dalai Lama the, uh, uh, in Lhasa at that time, um, mentions about the spiritual uh, head rather than the temporal head position. Uh, and the 1943 uh, State Department uh, Mamoy also is very important where they would mention uh, of skirting the claim on suzerainty or Tibet uh, and the uh, Republic of China constitution, including Tibet, uh, as part of China. So the Americans have taken a position uh, not on the sovereignty, but on the human rights, on ideological issues like uh, uh, religious freedom and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so this is one which is a dominant theme in the U.S. Uh, decisions towards uh, policies towards uh, Tibet. Uh, there is the uh, the uh, the concern expressed by the Tibetan side, uh, even as the Communist Party was uh, marching uh, uh, in the 1940s, displacing the Komintang uh, and running over in Qinghai, in Kansu, in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, and other places, there is a refusal by the U.S. administrations to accommodate the Tibetan uh, requests for assistance. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Delhi uh, equally uh, was, uh, was reluctant to have any track one kind of interactions uh, at one level. There is uh, the Tibetan Foreign Bureau uh, in 1949, November, seeking assistance. Uh, from the U.S., uh, U.K., and other countries. There was the uh, letter to President Truman by the Tibet Foreign Bureau uh, and the Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, 
for help, but nothing really. They didn't even acknowledge the letter, by the way. Uh, so, which suggests there is the reluctance on the U.S. administration to look at uh, Tibet in a uh, sovereign uh, factor. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, but soon after the 17-point agreement was signed uh, in May 1951, you have the uh, the United States uh, wanting the Dalai Lama to leave Tibet uh, and providing assistance. Even here, they were not mentioning about uh, the, uh, the independence of Tibet, but about the uh, autonomy for Tibet uh, as a head of autonomous Tibet that uh, the U.S. was prepared to at the most. Uh, so we did see uh, 1960s uh, huge assistance in terms of the guerrilla warfare in uh, Nepal bordering with Tibet, uh, but that's just amounts to about $1.7 million um, a year uh, as compared to $26 million that the TPSA promises uh, last month uh, for various Tibetan activities. Um, so there were just about 2,100 guerrillas as the recent CIA documents declassified uh, suggested. And uh, this assistance is not enough for uh, any uh, meaningful uh, you know breakup uh, from the uh, from the chinese rule uh, so the uh, overall the focus is then on mainly human rights uh, violations uh, on uh, religious freedom uh, and so on and so forth uh, then you have the um, the uh, secret visit by henry kissinger and nixon uh, then the folding up of the uh, CIA operations, the investments or even arms sales in 1984, arms sales to the Chinese um, was made. Um, uh, in fact, Black Hawk helicopters are deployed in Tibet uh, by the Chinese uh, straight away from the American uh, defense industries. Uh, because of the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989, these arm sales were uh, not possible later because of a ban that was imposed. Uh, so the key aspect is uh, in terms of the uh, economic and trade and investments uh, to woo the uh, American businesses into the China market and Tibet market. Uh, so, so one of the policies that the Tibetan diaspora uh, is to make, and this is to address Mr. Verma's comments, is to work with the U.S. Congress, which is uh, which is uh, a uh, easier way than with the executive, uh, the president. So we have seen since then the U.S. Congress uh, taking much uh, active role, uh, and uh, the Dalai Lama was invited for the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Uh, in uh, September 1987, uh, and the House of Representatives adopting a bill uh, condemning the human rights abuses and so on and so forth. Uh, since then, there is an interest that is generated in the legislature, and uh, that provided some kind of a support to the diaspora. Uh, and the the uh, September 21, uh, 1987, uh, the Dalai Lama's five points uh, for the U.S. Congressional Human Rights Caucus, that is very important uh, departure from the uh, the previous uh, Tibetan policies, uh, where the zone of peace, uh, the population transfer policy, that is harmonization. Uh, then there is the uh, human rights and democratic freedoms uh, uh, of the Tibetans. Then uh, restoring and protecting uh, Tibet's uh, environment. Uh, then the negotiations for the free status of Tibet with the Chinese. These were made, and that uh, is a starting point for what we now have seen uh, the the Strasbourg proposals and uh, subsequently the uh, United Front Work Department uh, meetings with the uh, the uh, Dalai Lama uh, administration. Uh, so this has also resulted in the uh, U.S. President Ronald Reagan signing the Foreign Relations Authorization Act 
in December 1987 in a span of about three months, uh, expressing sympathy for the Tibetans uh, and uh, criticizing China's treatment on treatment uh, of the Tibetan population uh, and ending human rights violations, uh, uh, suggesting to a constructive dialogue uh, on the future of Tibet, uh, then on releasing the political prisoners. As you know, in 1987-88, when uh, the Drepung Monastery uh, uh, monks protested, they were all jailed. Some 51 uh, were taken in uh, at that time. And uh, um, while briefly they were released, uh, yet several hundreds were again arrested after the 1988-89 uh, incidents. So uh, this was the background for the U.S. Uh, so there is a certain tradition that is reflected here uh, in terms of the U.S. congressional uh, interference. And that is where the Tibetan diaspora succeeded to an extent to raise this issue uh, rather than in a bilateral fashion between U.S. and China. There is now a, uh, a window of opportunity that is visible with the working with the U.S. Congress. Um, uh, we did see uh, the U.S. active support to the Tibetan uh, diaspora uh, in terms of giving scholarships and others, which the TPSA also mentions about the the number of scholarships to be increased of funding for the Tibetan uh, education and others. Uh, the issues on religious freedom uh, and human rights have been regularly raised in the in the uh, several statements of the uh, State Department in conjunction with the, the 1987 uh, Act. Um, there is a certain elevation of uh, the Tibet factor as well, with the ambassador at large uh, for religious affairs. And in private, the U.S. Um, uh, community mentions about that person as the ambassador to Tibet uh, in the discussions. Uh, so we have had uh, Julia Tuft, Maria Ortega, the uh, Paula Dobryansky, and currently Robert Destro. Uh, however, we have seen during the Obama administration when the G2 concept uh, became quite prominent between uh, China and the U.S., uh, a Brzezinski's idea of G2, uh, that the U.S. and China will rule the rules uh, across the globe. Uh, and this has led to uh, the uh, strategic and economic dialogues, and incidentally, uh, none of these ambassador to, ambassadors at large for religious affairs uh, took part in the discussions in the strategic and economic dialogues between U.S. and China. Uh, in fact, with the uh, with the Chinese sensitivities uh, uh, kept in mind, the uh, the U.S. had jettisoned the ambassador at large for. Tibetan affairs to uh, be part of these discussions. Uh, uh, presumably, these will be restored after the TPSA uh, is uh, implemented, uh, but we have to see how the progress is. Uh, in this connection, the meeting between Robert Destro and the Sikyong uh, uh, recently in the State Department uh, is a major uh, takeaway uh, in terms of the, the Tibetan cause. Uh, the Tibet Policy Act of 2002 has been mentioned, and Mr. Verma alluded to the Bush administration's reluctance to implement many of the provisions of the TPA. Uh, and uh, there is also the, uh, the um, Trump administration almost um, recently uh, cutting down funding for the Tibetans. Uh, uh, in the general policy of cutting down funds for every other um, activity, there is in the isolationist policy of the Trump administration, there was also that thinking process that was going on. Uh, and then suddenly we saw the TPSA um, uh, last year with the discussions uh, going on. Uh, so there is the, the uh, zigzag policy which really makes uh, every other country, including India, to think twice on what exactly is the commitment of the U.S. towards the the uh, the uh, 
uh, Tibet issue. Uh, the reciprocal access to Tibet Act of 2018, uh, as well as several provisions which, uh, which uh, if you look at uh, identifying individuals who were blocked uh, from the U.S. Uh, entry during the preceding year, and a list of Chinese officials who were substantially involved in the formulation or execution and of policies to restrict access to the U.S. Uh, uh, diplomats or journalists or citizens to the Tibet areas. Uh, if one has to implement this, this is going to be a humongous task uh, on identifying those officials who are responsible for these uh, these uh, uh, actions. Uh, uh, so in the implementation portion that is going to become a big uh, uh, issue uh, altogether. So um, uh, let me touch upon uh, Mr. Verma's uh, uh, points uh, in the final uh, section where the, uh, the impact on the diaspora, number one, number two, and the impact on India whether we can see this as an opportunity or as a challenge. Um, in terms of the diaspora, there is now uh, uh, the, uh, the encouragement that the TPSA provides. Uh, there is a certain funding that is laid down in the TPSA. Uh, secondly, the TPSA also praises the Dalai Lama for transferring uh, some of the powers uh, as in uh, 2011. Um, to the Sikyong in terms of the temporal powers uh, and the democratization process. Um, in 2011, 2016, and currently, we are seeing the uh, election process um, um, on the way. Uh, the second phase of uh, voting will be done in a few months. Uh, so the intensification of democrat democratization uh, within the Tibetan side uh, is seen as a, a positive signal from the U.S. Uh, and uh, also in the case of India, in terms of India's foreign policy since 2001, uh, there has been a mention in the Ministry of External Affairs uh, annual report about promoting democracy abroad. And this is seen in the immediate vicinity of South Asia, Southern Asia, um, Southern Asia concept from the uh, from including Tibet in that portion, uh, so the the encouragement for uh, democratization in the TPSA uh, is conducive for India in terms of that uh, overall foreign policy promotion of democracy abroad. Prime Minister Modi spoke about democracy uh, in uh, Japan in September 2014. Uh, then. There is also the funding for the United Nations uh, in terms of the democracy fund, et cetera, has increased uh, uh, compared to other countries. So this is one where we could probably see the impact, uh, democratization of the Tibetan diaspora, uh, leading to uh, a strengthening of the one of the objectives of uh, India's foreign policy, number one. Uh, number number two is the... the um, uh, whether it is an opportunity or a challenge. Um, the problem here is we are not sure about the consistency of the U.S. in implementing the TPSA, um, whether this is going to be put on the back burner by the Biden administration. We do not know. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Biden's suggestion for bringing in democracies together uh, could also mean uh, much for the, the uh, Tibetan democracy as well. Uh, so we need to watch what could happen in this uh, sphere. Uh, but there is this uncertainty uh, every four or five years when the U.S. administrations keep changing uh, and the uncertainty on Tibet, uncertainty on the uh, the India's policy vis-a-vis -vis Tibet. To what extent is the commitment of the U.S. on Tibet? That is a, a crucial problematic for India to fathom. Uh, and hence, uh, it is still not clear how it is going to be a, an opportunity or a challenge. Um, uh, challenges, yes, there are several, uh, at least four of them. Number one, uh, when we mention about Tibet, 
Uh, it is uh, the uh, historically uh, India and China uh, did not had a border. It is between Tibet and uh, India. Uh, and in none of the Indian statements with China, uh, India never mentioned about the uh, Tibet as a historical part of China, uh, which, suggesting that the uh, number one, it is partly related to Tawang, uh, where the uh, 15th century Dalai Lama had uh, uh, had uh, come from, uh, but also it is related to the overall territorial dispute between India and China. Uh, so what we now call as India-China borders um, never existed before 70 years. Uh, it is the PLA march uh, in 1951 that we, for the first time, saw the Chinese connection to the India-China border areas. Uh, so the, uh, in the light of what Claude has mentioned just now about the uh, build-up since May last year, and the Galwan incident where 20 Indian soldiers were killed. Uh, we are in the midst of a war with China at the moment. Uh, and so there are several uh, challenges that the territorial dispute uh, uh, exhibits, number one. Number two, uh, as has also been raised in the TPSA, there is the mention about environment. Uh, in the WikiLeaks, there is a major section where the Dalai Lama focuses on the uh, the melting of the glaciers uh, and the environmental issue as a major concern in the next 15, 20 years time. Uh, so this is an indication to suggest that the uh, the environmental issues have major concern. And as a part of it, the third major challenge that is the water resources. Uh, the TPSA mentions about the 1.8 billion people living downstream uh, and uh, the various uh, uh, run of the river or river diversion projects that China is uh, at the moment uh, organizing uh, are of uh, major concerns for uh, India. Uh, it is estimated that uh, uh, in uh, when the when the Yalung Zampo becomes Brahmaputra at Namcha Barwa, it carries something like 62 billion cubic meters of water. And when Brahmaputra enters Bangladesh in Mizoram, uh, it, it carries something like 220 billion cubic meters of water. So in the uh, in in uh, Namcha Barwa to about uh, Mizoram, you have something like 150 billion cubic meters, depending on the season, depending on the flows. Uh, so it appears India is following a pragmatic policy at this moment. Uh, with hardly any uh, leverage that it could exercise. But I would suggest three or four ways that this could be addressed. One is to talk to the Tibetans uh, on the Yarlung Zampo related uh, matter, number one. Take it to the World Water Council uh, for arbitration. Uh, India did go to the Permanent Code of Arbitration on the UNCLOS with Bangladesh. Uh, and of course, it lost these two islands to Bangladesh. Uh, but most important, it was settled through the uh, legalistic, uh, you know, uh, conventions. So that is uh, one way of dealing with the matter on the uh, dam construction, on the water uh, diversion, uh, etc. Uh, finally, of course, India could also mobilize the the lower riparian states, uh, such as uh, Bangladesh, such as the uh, Myanmar. Uh, Laos, Cambodia, uh, in terms of the Salween, Irrawaddy, uh, Mekong, uh, and other uh, rivers downstream. So it is quite possible that uh, we could mobilize a multilateral fora uh, in terms of the, uh, the lower riparian states uh, in the uh, um, in the background of the TPSA uh, mentioning about the water issues. Um, uh, then there is also a negative aspect, which is on security. Um, Claude did mention about the uh, the border regions, Himalayan regions. Uh, one of the things we are going to see uh, in the near future is the 158 monasteries that are located in the Trans-Himalayan region, 
Um, uh, in terms of uh, the renminbi collections, uh, in terms of uh, um, the uh, elections to the head monks and others, uh, thirdly, in terms of uh, law and order, uh, which is going to be uh, a crucial thing for India in terms of this uh, trans-Himalayan border regions. So I do see uh, a certain um, animation uh, in the trans-Himalayan borders uh, in the light of uh, the, the changes that have happened, both um, as a result of Galwan uh, and as a result of the TPSA. Uh, so let me stop here and willing to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kondopoli. Absolute brilliant exposition about the you know, the U.S. debate relations. I think that puts everything in context, and I think it's very important uh, that you came up with uh, with that aspect of it because it gives you an overview about what are the what are the uh, shortcomings, what are the problems, what are the hurdles that come in the way of the implementation of the TPSA in in its word and spirit. And I think there are definitely huge challenges, and one has to wait to see how the Biden administration uh, takes this up. Although we have had a bipartisan consensus on the passage of this act, uh, but then, you know, administrations change, and the executive does play a very important role into seeing what gets priority over what. And uh, there is a lot of dynamics in the Sino-US relations, so how far they want to go with it. A lot of this, therefore, rests on how the Tibetan diaspora, I mean, they've been given a place of uh, recognition uh, with the with the CTA being uh, recognized as, as the legitimate government uh, of the Tibet in the next exile. So I think there are very important ingredients in that. And it uh, actually, uh, we'll have to see how it works out and then how uh, Delhi uh, has to then align itself uh, with a larger context, uh, you know, being a front line, being in a standoff with the Chinese at this point of time, uh, with Tibet under pressure in many, many ways. And the uh, uh, the uh, whole, uh, you know, 100,000 uh, Tibetans in uh, in India. Uh, all this is is, is uh, dynamics, and I think very very important. So, without going further into actually uh, trying to summarize what you said, let me go back to uh, Buchungla and say that you know, in view of uh, the flavor in in in, uh, in the U.S. at this point of time, and the uh, what I would say a pushback of the Trump administration. Do you see? Uh, the implementation of the TPSA by the Biden administration, what do you read at this point of time? How do you see it in the run-up and now? Uh, over to you, Buchungla. Yeah, uh, Mr. Warma, I think before I touch this, I just wanted to comment on some of the other aspects that need a little bit of clarification. Please, uh, please. First, uh, I think, Mr. Warma, you said that the Senate passed it in December, uh, TPSA. Uh, actually, uh, I'll touch that again separately, but uh, the initially TPS was a self-standing legislation. It was introduced both in the House and the Senate separately in September 2019. In January, the House uh, passed it as a self-standing uh, uh, bill on its own, but the Senate could not pass it. And therefore, there was a change in the uh, decision of how it should go through finally. And it was uh, the congressional staffers who we work with decided that it's in the best interest of the legislation to put it together with the uh, appropriations bill, the omnibus bill that was going through. So both the House and the Senate had their own version of the TPSA in these uh, appropriations bill. And so uh, that was passed on December 21. So both House and the Senate passed that on December 21. So that's one thing. Again, a slight uh, nuance. Mr. Kondobali touched on a few things, again, that needs clarification. First, the ambassador at large for religious freedom is different from the uh, special coordinator for Tibetan issues. There is specific different special coordinator for Tibetan issues, which uh, has been there since uh, 2000, uh, even before, since 1998 starting from Mr. Greg Craig to uh, Mr. Uh, Destro. They, they are not the special uh, ambassador at large for religious freedom. That's a different office in the State Department, which is currently held by Mr. Ambassador Sam Brownback. Uh, then also in terms of the funding, uh, Mr. Kondabali felt that uh, Trump cut the Tibet programs in his bill. Uh, as I said earlier, 
the humanitarian and other assistance for Tibet was only formalized in the TPAC this time. Prior to that, it was Congress that brought in all these uh, programs for the Tibetans uh, every year. The president's budget did not carry many of these programs. Uh, but then Congress, not just on Tibet, but on many other issues, it says the president's budget is just a, a president's uh, idea. Congress will decide what to uh, apportion. So, so in the past, even during President Obama's time and before, Congress did, uh, the president's budget did not have many of these Tibet programs. It was the Congress that was putting them in. So that's the difference again, just to put that in perspective. Thirdly, uh, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, Mr. Kondabuli wondered what was the impl implementation aspect of it might be. In fact, on July 7th uh, last year, Secretary Pompeo already announced that some Chinese officials have been banned under this act. So they did not, State Department did not release the name. So that is, it's already being implemented. So from that perspective, uh, it's fine. And as for the Biden administration not or uh, implementing TPSA, I have less worry than the Trump administration, to be frank, because of two things. First, Vice President Biden, in his September 2020 statement, he frankly said how he will uh, touch on the Tibetan issue. And it was uh, uh, quite uh, uh, broad based, uh, which included supporting dialogue and reaching out to other governments which are there in the TPSA. Uh, in fact, President Trump appointing uh, Mr. Destro as a special coordinator may have something to do with Mr. Biden's statement because in Mr. Biden's statement, he says he uh, criticizes Trump administration for not even appointing the statutory uh, uh, position of the special content. That was in September and Mr. Destro was appointed in October. So these are just uh, some of the aspects that I think we need to uh, uh, think of. In terms of the timeline, as I said earlier, in uh, 2019, prior to that, there was a history of the TPA or the TPA being amended, but uh, uh, that will take a long time for me to explain. Suffice it to say that there was a talk even way back in 2011 to amend the TPA because of the absence of dialogue with the Chinese and because of changes in Dharamsala's position, because of, uh, position in the sense, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had devolved authority and uh, there, is, there was questions of succession of uh, or the reincarnation process of the Dalai Lama. So all these needed to be addressed. And that was the uh, need to uh, felt to amend the uh, TPA. Uh, in subsequent discussions with our congressional staffers, because one thing different from India and the United States in terms of the legislative process is that the congressional staffers have as much or play more important role in molding uh, such policy initiatives because the members of Congress themselves don't have that much of time to touch all the uh, areas. So uh, the staffers, it depends on them how to uh, sort of uh, present initiatives and propose these things. So in their discussion at that time, staffers felt that maybe at that time the political climate wasn't there. I'm talking about 19, uh, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, something along those lines. Uh, the political climate wasn't that uh, good so that if we open up the TPA for amendment, rather than strengthening it, it could be that it might lead to even weakening it further. So it wasn't touched. It was then in 2019, after the passage of the Tibet, uh, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act in 2018, there was a need felt. And every year ICT together with uh, uh, at one time Leader Pelosi and then after Speaker Pelosi's office, we have a strategy session and 2019 strategy session, it was decided that the TPSA would be taken up. First, the name TPSA came only later. There was different names uh, during the working stage. In March, it was discussed. In April, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern uh, wanted to take the lead on this because of his uh, concern for the Tibetan issue and so because of his success with RATA too. So his staff and we started discussing on the text, draft text, and there were a series of draft texts thereafter. That was the internal discussion going on. Outwardly in July, Mr. McGovern, when he addressed a Tibetan town hall in New York, he expressed his desire to introduce such a legislation. That was the first time in public that uh, they talked about such a legislation. And in September, uh, both the House and the Senate, uh, September 13th House and September 24th, the Senate, they introduced 
uh, the, the TP essay after quite a bit of changes uh, in the text, etc. And uh, a House Foreign Affairs passed it in December and the House itself passed it in January uh, 2020. The House version was then taken up by the Senate, which also had its own version uh, uh, of TPSA. And the Senate, uh, actually, the, as we know, the legislation first has to go through the committee and then the full House of the Senate. So the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was to take it up in May. In fact, it was listed in the calendar of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but that did not happen at the last moment. First, the May uh, meeting, May 13 meeting was postponed. And then on May 21, when the uh, Foreign Relations meeting was held, TPSA was listed uh, among those legislations to be taken up. Unfortunately, there was some sort of internal uh, difference, not on Tibet, but many other legislations which were there, which did not go through between the Republicans and the Democratic uh, side. And so uh, TPS did not go through. And then uh, the election cycle was getting closer because it was uh, uh, October, November uh, period was coming up soon. So in July, we discussed with uh, congressional staffers to see what other options could be there if uh, the normal process of uh, freestanding legislation could not take place. And eventually, uh, congressional staffers found this process of including Tibet legislation in the broader Consolidated Appropriations Act, which is called the Omnibus Act. And thus both the House and the Senate uh, added this in their uh, respective uh, budget uh, legislation. And that's how it was passed. In When the budget was passed on December 21st, the TPAS got passed, and then the president signed it on December 27th. So that is that part. Interestingly, the TPA also was passed under such a format, where it was included in the Foreign Authorization Appropriation Act of uh, uh, that year, 2002. And, and that is how uh, it uh, made sense. But one point I just want to say in closing, I don't think India should look to the United States for or uh, encouragement, inspiration. India has its own capability. It's different from the United States. So it doesn't matter what the United States does. Only thing I would like to ask is that Indian policymakers, Indian opinion makers, Indian uh, public uh, servants, look at the Tibetan issue differently than they have been looking at it so far. Because as it is uh, Tibetan uh, in the United States, one difference is that Tibetan issue, the Tibetan people are not being just merely looked upon as recipients of American uh, support, but more as uh, constituents by the legislators. Tibetan Americans are a constituent. There are followers of Tibetan Buddhism in India. There are Tibetans who have become Indian citizens. They are constituents. They have as much an interest in India taking uh, uh, a different approach on the issue of Tibet than uh, any other people. So if we can look at it that from that perspective, India may find its own creative ways, not necessarily through legislation, as I think uh, Claude was saying earlier, but through other ways of uh, being more uh, being proactive on the political aspect of the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bujungla. I think uh, that clarification was very much uh, I think uh, required and uh, it does give us an uh, insight into how the legislation was taken, how much uh, of uh, consideration and thought has gone into the formation of this. Uh, before I uh, go to uh, to Claude and, and to uh, Professor Mr. Wonder Warma, yes. Mr. Warma, if you don't mind. Yes. If you Please. don't mind, I, I forgot one thing that's important. Yes. In, the, in the House version of the past, or, or rather in the Senate version of the uh, uh, bill, the TPSA, there's a reference in the initial stages. Uh, the there was a stronger reference to the CTA, right? Than what is out there. And although you use the term recognition, I would not use the term because, again, to be fair to the legislation, the legislation just says uh, it uh, CTA represents and reflects aspirations of the Tibetans and diaspora. So, uh, uh, no political concept. You have to understand that in uh, the right con uh, way. And so oh, that too. And then there was a reference to the historical status of Tibet in the previous uh, Senate, which way uh, 
it recalls one of the legis one of the legislations in 1992 that talked about Tibet as an occupied land, which is not there in the final. Uh, it did not find a place in the final TPSA that we know of. So these are uh, some of the things because I see people talking about some of these things, thinking that these are in the past legislation. They are not. No, thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification. This is a very important one. Uh, before I, I go to uh, Claude and, and to Professor Kondapalli for, uh, for the concluding remarks, because I, I wouldn't then want to open it up uh, for question and answers. We are running a little uh, short of time. Uh, do you think, uh, Butchung Lai, and if others can also answer it in the, in the group, uh, do you see that this is a time when uh, we would probably the Tibetan uh, uh, the CTA and the diaspora actually looks at uh, or reviews the uh, the part of uh, the middle way approach is are we going is this a forerunner to something more serious that is going to happen between the uh, t between the, the, the Tibetan and uh, and the way we they align themselves with the implementation of the uh, TPSA that's a question that I would throw open uh, please if you want to answer it now or maybe uh, in a few minutes uh, Claude, any views, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Professor Kondapalli, any views on this or any other subject that you might like to touch before we move on to the Q&A? Yeah, uh, my short response to you is it's up to the Tibetan people. Uh, I do not see the TPAC opening the door for such a discussion. But that discussion has been always been going on in the Tibetan community, both in it sometimes more so in an emotional way than rather than in a, well, uh, like a, a rational way. Uh, there is a political uh, system in the Ramsala uh, for good or for bad. And uh, uh, the very topic that you mentioned about whether Tibetans should change the course of political struggle was also part of the, uh, somewhat part of the discussion during the primary election stage. We might see more of these depending on uh, who the final two candidates are and uh, how uh, these develop. So I think that can go on its own without being related to the TPSA, because TPSA is not talking about what the Tibetan status is. I, I think Mr. Kondopoli rightly put it. The United States has found a way to address the Tibetan issue without touching on the, uh, the political status, which is a different uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, Claudia, would you like to say something more than... Uh, uh, about? Yes, I'm going to about the middle path approach. I think it doesn't take into consideration some of the Indian concern, especially regarding the border. Because if you give to China uh, the foreign affair and the defense, the border issue is, is not solved for India. So this will have to be looked into by the Tibetans. It's their decision. I want to say also that regarding the middle path approach is something which was conceived in um, 85, 86. There was a series of letters from uh, Rajiv Gandhi to His Holiness. And uh, as Bhushana mentioned that, uh, and uh, Shrikant also, that uh, His Holiness went to Washington DC in, in September and uh, presented this five point peace plan. But situation has evolved. Today, uh, we are facing a China which is different. There were leaders like uh, Zhao Yobang, Zhao Jiang, even in some way, uh, Chen Xiaoping, were more open. They had agreed to, uh, in 79, to have some delegation from Dharamsala to come. Today, the situation is much more difficult, and I don't think Xi Jinping, the way he has put his grip on Tibet, is totally different from the situation in 885. But vis-a-vis -vis India, um, the middle path today doesn't answer all the concern of India, especially on the border. I mean, Ladakh issue has nothing to do with Tibet, except few areas in Ladakh, like Demshoka, in contact with Tibet. It's mainly with Xinjiang, and, but still the rest of the border and what has happened to, I mean, what has come up today in the news about uh, Upper Subantari, it's definitely about the Tibetan military uh, district. So that would not solve that issue for India. So this, I think the Tibetan have to take into consideration, think about it. In any case today, as we have seen during the eight rounds of talks, nothing much has happened in China, Facing India, 50,000 each 
top stage side has not uh, changed any uh, in anything in its position of uh, of April May. So today the Tibetans are not in a position to really negotiate. Bushonglai knows because he's been part of the team. But I think something like the American legislation, and if there's a change of mind in Delhi, could really greatly help. You have to, you should not forget that in 1965, a new prime minister came in India. And um, before going to Tashkent, uh, he called Chakapa, who was his holiness representative in Delhi, and he told him, I will, re I will recognize uh, the Tibetan government in exile when I come back. Unfortunately, uh, Lalba Dochastri never came back from Tashkent. But things can change, can, can change. Today, unfortunately, the leadership doesn't put its mind because there are so many other things to deal with. But we should be grateful to the Chinese with their virus, they have made the world, they have made India, they have made America much more aware of what is behind the present regime. It's not a question of Chinese people. Chinese people are like any people in the world, but the present regime has something which should change or should go. Right. And unless this will go, I think we will have a problem in uh, finding a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kondopelli, any, any comments? Uh, well, on revisiting the middle path approach, uh, two things have come about in the recent times. One is the uh, the, the no progress on the uh, nine talks uh, between the United Front Work Department and the CTA, uh, despite the feelers being sent to Dharamshala and others. Uh, number one. Number two, the August 29th uh, Tibet Forum meeting on sinicization of Buddhism. Uh, it's a, a very drastic policy that uh, Xi Jinping is going to implement. Uh, and we have seen the reflection of those in various forms uh, in the security field, in the, uh, in the religious field and others. Uh, so I think uh, the middle path approach needs to be revised uh, uh, in terms of the, but that is um, uh, in in the background of what is happening on India-China border areas. Right, right. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Konopoli. Uh, uh, again, uh, Burma. Any questions? So yes, yes, Mutungla, please. Yeah, I forgot to respond to the pandemic issue. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Claude, and you have mentioned earlier. I don't think the issue of the, the coronavirus had any impact on the TPS passage from from a congressional perspective. With President Trump, uh, uh, it was more it fit with his hard. If you can look at it from that perspective, hardening position on China. So uh, there was nothing uh, from that angle uh, because it wasn't. I, I seriously do not think. Obviously, the political climate was such that people would uh, uh, find it easy to accept. Uh, but related to that, I think Mr. Uh, Professor Condoboli earlier mentioned about um, uh, President George W. Bush having some reservations on the TPA when he signed that into. Uh, that, I think, again, we have to find, understand the political difference between a veto and expressing reservations, such reservations. Bush did not veto TPA, so that TPA was not uh, nullified. He rather expressed his own feelings, which even congressional research uh, uh, group has found that it it doesn't have any impact uh, on the uh, the legal aspect of law. In fact, it was Bush, because one of his reservation was on the appointment of the special coordinator, but it was Bush who elevated it to the position of the undersecretary level rather than reducing it. So that I think that was more uh, political stand that was taken rather than a serious objection to TP. Right. It was an observation really uh, by him. He had signed, uh, signed it into law, but he, this was just an observation. And to your point, I must just correct, uh, the idea was, uh, what I was saying was not recognition of the CTA, sir, but the recognition of the role of the CTA in, in actually the dealing with the Tibet. And that's what I meant. Uh, Ribbon, are we, uh, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, not so far, but perhaps uh, we could give them a minute or so uh, to Okay. Just collect their thoughts. Time possibly, because we have about 10 minutes, 7, 8 minutes to go. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Varma, I want to say also, yes. Mr. India. Yes, please. If you allow me. Claude, yes, of course. You see, 
the Prime Minister, when he came first for his inauguration, he invited Tik Yong and Dolman Yali to the inauguration. Right. That everyone thought that all the policy will be changed. And later on, he really tried to uh, engage Xi Jinping. He went to Wuhan, the Wuhan consensus. He invited Xi Jinping to Mabalipuram, the Chennai Connect, and he really tried. And what happened in Ladakh, when India was in a difficult position with the virus starting picking up in, in India, I think will not be forgotten. So that will be also an influence even if it doesn't translate immediately today, if the MEA has not really changed its policy, I think ultimately the prime minister will not forget what, what, what has happened. And uh, it will, I think it will have uh, implication and uh, hopefully uh, positive consequences for the policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Tibet. Yeah, just to add uh, to what you're saying, Claude, I would say that, you know, since 2010 also, we've stopped talking about the one China and uh, we have not uh, said that since then. And we did bring up the one India with the with the Chinese, even though it was at the periphery of, uh, of uh, the conclusion of talks. Uh, but the foreign minister of the day actually did bring it up. I don't know whether these things are all uh, uh, going to be thought of in terms of reviving these kind of sentiments. And, uh, you know, you're in the middle of a, of a very serious standoff. I think there is a, a lot at stake. So I can understand uh, the uh, foreign ministry uh, going carefully in a very calibrated manner into how to resolve these issues. But I'm sure these are things which engage their minds. And I'm sure they're looking at various opportunities and ways uh, uh, to be able to... Uh, uh, to, to, I wouldn't say push back the Chinese, but to at least definitely uh, come back to the Chinese with a, some position of strength. We've already shown it on the on the geography, on the territory we've shown it. We probably need to show it politically. Economics will probably take a little longer because of the huge integration of the economies and probably take a little longer. So I think it's all, it's, there are things in the works and uh, the direction at least one sees in the media, and that's uh, what we are privy to at this point of time. There is definitely a rethink. In the, in the, uh, and this is evident in the statements that are being made by the foreign minister or by the Ministry of uh, External Affairs as well as other ministries about how they look at China. People are actually very disappointed and uh, they have called them, uh, you know, deceptive, deceitful. Lots of very strong words have been used. And uh, I think they're, they're, they're well put because uh, this is exactly the sentiment uh, that the Chinese have actually uh, shown on the, on the ground. So I think let's see. Let's see how it goes forward. Uh, Rebon, anything at this point of time? Um, yes, uh, we have one uh, participant, um, Sharab Borzulla, who would like to uh, pose his question. Sharabla, you have the option of either putting on your uh, video so that we can all see you perhaps. So would you like to ask your question and maybe you can also figure out who you would like to address it to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And this also, sorry, uh, Sharabla, one minute. Um, should there be uh, other participants who would like to pose a question kindly unmute, then I would have the pleasure of uh, uh, calling your name and then you could pose your question to the panelists concerned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tashtile. My bandwidth might not allow me my, uh, me to open my video. Uh, so, Tashtile, all. My uh, question is for Pujungla. Uh, it's a two part question, sir. Um, following the uh, Tibet Policy Act in 2002, uh, how do you think was the CTA, or for that matter, the larger Tibetan diaspora and supporters were able to leverage the Tibet Policy Act back then? And going forward, oh, what do you think should the next Kashyap do to leverage that uh, that policy, the new Tibet Policy uh, Support Act? Uh, the part two being, uh, you are being part of the uh, negotiations team, uh, how do you think the 2002 Act actually uh, affected uh, the 2002-2007 nego negotiations that happened, the dialogue? And going forward, uh, do you think that this uh, new Tibet uh, Policy Support Act will play any role in either helping or hindering uh, negotiations or dialogues with China? Thank you. Thank you. Your voice was slow, so I may not have caught everything, but I think you made two points. First, uh, how how did the Tibetan CTA and the Tibetans leverage TPA? when you got the pass in 2002. I think at that time, Mr. Kasur um, Lodi uh, he was the special envoy of his office to Dalai Lama here, and he was uh, in the process of beginning 
uh, the dialogue uh, process with the Chinese leadership, which he was leading. And so he was able to use the provision of the Tibet Policy Act in terms of American administration's encouragement of the dialogue process. So uh, I was privileged to be part of many of the internal uh, strategic discussions that he had with uh, uh, administration officials in uh, exchanging ideas and in enabling other European governments to play roles in encouraging the Chinese uh, uh, authorities to uh, start the dialogue process and, and to sort of mold uh, the way in a way. Uh, the TPA also has a provision for uh, United States to take up the cause of Tibetan political prisoners uh, for their release. And if you uh, look at uh, developments between 2002-03 to around 2005-06, you'll find that China released prominent Tibetan political prisoners, uh, including one who is who actually carried an Indian IC, Naong Chirpal, but China released all of them to the United States uh, at that time. And I believe it was because the United States administration was uh, putting enough pressure on China to do that. At that time, the political climate was also different. Uh, than what it is now. And uh, China may have needed America to, uh, to undertake some of its agenda. That could uh, could not be ruled out. But uh, nevertheless, from uh, the Tibetan side, I think uh, I would say that we have been able to leverage it well. In terms of the Tibetan public, I think it gave the Tibetan public a boost that the United States was there, out there now, not just saying it supported Tibet, but putting that into a law uh, with concrete uh, uh, details outside there. How can we use TPSA now? I think it, uh, TPSA itself is a resource. We need a strategy to use that resource. So if the CTA comes up with a strategy to sort of take uh, advantage of the resources available in the TPA, uh, TPSA, then that's something that I think it will very much be uh, uh, available, uh, not just to uh, uh, in the case of United States, but even in other countries, because there are different aspects of TPSA. As I said earlier, you don't have to replicate TPSA in other countries to or implement some of the field. Religious freedom aspect of it, the succession of His Holiness to the Dalai Lama. Some European countries have already started talking out of it. More, and also some UN agencies have started uh, talking on the uh, issue of reincarnation. So these are some things that uh, in uh, in totality strengthens his holiness the Dalai Lama's position on the issue of succession because China can no longer say it's only up to China even if it will continue to say that but its position is weakened because now uh, Tibetan Buddhists in the United States Tibetan Buddhists in India Tibetan Buddhists uh, I, when I say Tibetan it means followers of Tibetan Buddhism not necessarily Tibetans but it, they all have stakeholders they are all are uh, stakeholders Buddhists in Mongolia are stakeholders. China has to understand these. And now TPSA is saying legally, America is saying American Buddhists also have a stake in the future of the issue of uh, reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. So that can be done. Uh, we have two more questions. One is from Major General Sandhu, uh, followed by Mr. Heblikar. Please unmute them. Uh, yeah, they are unmuted. Uh, General Sandhu, can you hear? Okay. So could we uh, go on to Mr. Heblika? His mic yes, is sir. unmuted. Yes. Yes. No. No. I. I, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Heblika. Is he there? Yes, his mic is also unmuted, so I was under the pressure that he would like to pose a question. <clears throat> Mr. Gautam? Yeah, good evening. Uh, uh, I just want to know what is the status of uh, the Karma Park? Thank you. Who, who have you posed this question to? Anyone because uh, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> 
uh, if the questions about the present weather about of uh, the Galwakarmapa, then I'm as much in the uh, <laughs> I have as much knowledge as everybody has. He's currently outside of India, as you know. Uh, uh, that's about it that I uh, know. <laughs> I think there's a question, is Mr. Heblicker has probably not been able to get on, uh, but there was a question uh, that has come to me, uh, was that, uh, do you see, uh, Buchungla has probably went for you, uh, do you see a role uh, of the U.S. Uh, uh, in uh, for for using its influence in Nepal to, to rewrite their policy on Tibet or on Tibetans in Nepal? No, I don't uh, see a role if, uh, for the U.S. in the way it's specified there. Uh, I think uh, the United States uh, and many uh, countries uh, whose embassies are based in uh, Kathmandu have been playing a role in the past of uh, uh, coming together to uh, highlight their concern about the plight of the Tibetan people there uh, with the Nepalese government. Uh, and that has been effective and that... Uh, that also led to what we know of as the gentleman's agreement, uh, in a way, with uh, the Nepalese authorities agreeing to all, uh, giving the understanding that they will respect certain process in terms of uh, uh, the Tibetan refugees who come out through and uh, also in terms of providing registration certificates to uh, Tibetans who have been long-standing uh, residents of Nepal. Uh, I, what I Thing the Western, or not just the United States, all governments can do is to let the Nepalese government know that they can be, uh, uh, they can understand the concerns of the Chinese because they are immediately uh, the Chinese impact and so on. But at the same time, understand uh, Nepal's role as a country in itself, which has its own decision making authority when dealing with people within its territory. Right, right. I think you're very well answered. I think, yeah, it can be a you know, when we're starting talks, whether it's at a bilateral or trilateral or a multilateral level, and I think India would probably be looking for these kind of concerts of opinion. Perhaps this is something that uh, would figure in into thinking of the of the strategy makers uh, in, in both governments. Anyway, thank you, thank you so much for your answer. Any other thing, or should we round up? We are we are actually a little past uh, 8:30 now, Ravon. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any other uh, question coming up, but. Uh... It leaves me to thank um, uh, each of the panelists uh, for an amazingly good and a very informative session on the TPSA, the implementation, the future, the challenges and the opportunities that uh, Delhi has. Uh, to me, as, as a student of China, it, I think it was immensely informative and insightful and does keep my get my mind thinking. I'm sure I hope we are able to... Uh, uh, get others, uh, scholars, academics, and some of the people who deal with these subjects, diplomats, etc., who are on the uh, on the group at this point of time on the webinar, uh, to be able to uh, uh, take this uh, back and and chew on them and see whether this could be of any use to them. Hopefully, they would be. Uh, let me also thank uh, Ribbon and Professor Tandon for uh, their effort in putting this webinar together, and all that uh, the team that has come together to be able to make this. Uh, such a such a valuable session. Uh, thank you again, uh, panelists. Thank you for being, sparing your time, and thank you for sharing your information. With this, uh, let me uh, say uh, good night and uh, a good day to Puchungla in Washington. All the best, and we hope to see you again. There's another program which is coming up on the 22nd, uh, which FNBA is hosting. This is going to be the launch of the Tibet Brief 2020 of uh, Professor Michael Weinwald, Von Raab. Uh, if all of you can find the time, I think Prabhon will be sending out the links to everybody. Uh, please do attend. I think it uh, promises to be a very, very in, uh, important session. Uh, we've had, uh, we've got uh, uh, Ambassador Sham Saran to chair that session and a host of very, very good and eminent speakers on, on Tibet and knowledgeable people on the subject who will be participating with these few words. Thank you once again, everybody, and uh, see you again soon.